Hello and welcome to India Speak, the podcast by the Centre for Policy Research. I am Sushant Singh, Senior Fellow at CPR. You are listening to our special series titled Spotlight South Asia that brings leading experts from India's neighbourhood to understand the events in these countries, whether political, economic or social, but from a domestic perspective. The country featured today is Bhutan, and my guest is Tenzing Lamsang. Tenzing Lamsang is the editor of The Bhutanese. He was awarded the Best Investigative Journalism Award for four consecutive years by Bhutan's annual journalism awards. Having worked with the Indian Express as a reporter, he moved to Bhutan's national newspaper to insel as chief reporter in 2008 before working with Bhutan's first business paper, Business Bhutan, as its news editor. Lamsang launched the Bhutanese in 2012. He has contributed papers to the Institute of Defense and Studies Analysis in New Delhi and also written articles for various international publications. Tenzing, welcome to Spotlight South Asia. Yes, thank you very much. Tenzing, to begin with, uh, what is the one big difference between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic Bhutan? So, uh, I think in terms of pre- and post-pandemic Bhutan, uh, Bhutan is making use of the pandemic to launch a series of reforms. Uh, in governance, uh, in uh, tourism, and uh, other uh, subsectors as well. So I think that is the big uh, difference uh, in in the in the post-pandemic Bhutan. And uh, Tenzing, uh, stepping back a bit, how deeply has uh, democracy gotten embedded in Bhutan since uh, it went democratic? Since the king decided to make it democratic, and, and I mean this in an institutional sense, whether you're looking at political parties, whether you're looking at the leadership, whether you're looking at parliament. You are looking at institutions like the Election Commission. Uh, you know, what is the state currently and where do you think uh, it needs more work to strengthen itself and really uh, become deeply embedded in the society? I think there has been a sea change uh, pre-2008, which, which is before the first democratic general elections. Uh, people, the majority of Bhutanese were actually against the introduction of parliamentary democracy in Bhutan because uh, they felt uh, that we would uh, go the way of our neighbors in the neighborhood where democracy wasn't uh, as uh, flowering as well as it uh, should have, you know, with corruption and other issues. Um, so there was a great deal of fear. But I would say post-2008 onwards, now we are with our third elected government. Uh, I think democracy has, uh, uh, has gotten uh, stronger in Bhutan, I would say. Uh, like if I can give a few examples, uh, when you look at the institution of uh, uh, political parties uh, right now, apart from the two parties in uh, parliament, uh, which is the, the ruling and opposition parties, uh, we recently had, uh, I mean, in addition to the two parties in parliament, then we have uh, two parties outside parliament. Uh, and then we had one more party recently, just a few days back joining in. So now we have around five political parties. Uh, which are going, uh, which will uh, be going for the free elections uh, will be held next year. So that is in terms of parties that become more vibrant and people uh, in 2008 or pre-2008, people were reluctant to join uh, political parties. It was being seen as somebody who's political or a kind of a troublemaker, you know, kind of a thing. But uh, uh, I think now uh, people are happy to join parties. It's seen as an opportunity to uh, come into uh, a leadership role and uh, also in terms of uh, parliament the parliament has matured a lot and it has uh, taken on bigger and bigger responsibilities like if you see the initial in the first early days and early months of the Bhutanese parliament uh, the first couple of years in fact uh, after 2008 there was some confusion because people are not used to the parliamentary process there was a mix up, uh, mix up in the laws and procedures and all. But now the parliament has come into its own, its committees. Uh, you have these various parliamentary committees that come into its own. Lawmaking has become more sophisticated. Uh, people are doing more consultation in terms of uh, drafting laws. So even the parliament has come into its own, is uh, becoming a stronger institution by the day. Uh, then you have uh, the executive also uh, and then various uh, different agencies, stakeholders, different arms of the government working together. 
then we have uh, things like the uh, anti corruption commission election commission authority which is equivalent to a cag uh, being operating very independently and uh, autonomously so i think democracy has uh, and then uh, of course the media so democracy has taken root in bhutan uh, people are, and then people have become bolder uh, than uh, before and they get bolder every year in terms of voicing out the issues and uh, uh, we've had three elections and which each elections general elections and which three elections we have had three new governments so i think early on the people have realized that it's good to change governments frequently uh, because then you get the best of uh, each government because i think usually the studies have shown in the past that uh, a government is most effective in its first 5 years you give them a second term the effectiveness level, level comes down you give them a third term then it it kind of goes even further down so i think the bhutanese uh, electorate that way is very smart they want to try out everybody you know and that's why we are in the third uh, government third election with the third new government so you get the best of every government so yes democracy has uh, i would say taken root and strengthened and uh, and flowered in bhutan in fact yeah uh tenzing uh, if i may put it slightly differently uh, has democracy delivered to a to a great extent in bhutan when uh, because you said there were a lot of apprehensions when it started in 2008 yeah. uh, but now that you know nearly 14 years have passed but when someone like you who has been a very close observer looks at it looks at how people respond to it do you feel that democracy has delivered in some way to the people of bhutan maybe it has not delivered in all its uh, promises and you know expectations but it has definitely not disappointed also so i think if you look at the bigger picture is definitely a plus uh, because with uh, democracy uh, what's happened is uh, uh, it 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 it's its effect is there in the uh, i've already talked about the institutional aspects but if you go beyond the institutions if you go to the villages uh, people are more willing to voice out issues uh there is a greater degree of assertion of rights individual rights or you know human rights or media rights whatever you call it even to the extent of the animal animal rights and then we have a uh, bhutan uh, uh 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 also de uh, criminalized for example uh, uh uh homosexual activity you know uh, and then there's a gr- growing lgbtiq uh, kind of community in bhutan uh, Uh, and then animal rights and and you know all of that so so these softer aspects uh, so democracy may not have delivered on spectacular growth rates and economic self sufficiency which every political party promises but it has developed delivered on the other aspects in terms of rights in terms of speaking out so i think uh, I, i would call it uh, i think on the whole it's been a positive uh, the the downside of democracy has uh, kind of been uh, i think rather aggressive political competition during the elections uh, so things can be can get in a small country and society like bhutan uh, uh, you can things can get quite personal and you know uh, this what what we like to call harmony the harmony in society can be disrupted so that political competition that's the negative side uh, and then you know politicians like in every country make huge promises but they can't deliver so those are the negative aspects uh, and then you know politicization of of uh, you know people and you know sometimes civil servants also so so those are the negative aspects political uh, corruption let's say at times but i think on the whole it has been a positive process and positive journey then uh, think is there a difference in the generations of people how generations of bhutanese i mean to say younger bhutanese respond differently to democracy than older bhutanese uh, have, have you seen that kind of difference in in different generations of people in your mind the perception of democracy uh, i think the younger generation are definitely more outspoken more bolder because uh, this is where the cultural aspect of uh, what do you what do you call the democratic culture uh, comes into play so i think the the younger are more keen to embrace uh, democratic culture and fit in with the times so the older generation um, basically they come from an earlier time so i mean they also have adapted to democracy but uh, uh, i think that's where there's a slight qualitative difference but i wouldn't say a major difference also because even the older generation uh are, are i mean uh, very wise voters and all that and also um i think uh, in 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 terms of uh, uh, i think bhutan demographically is a primarily a younger country younger than india even you know so uh, it is the young that uh, kind of 
dictates election results primarily you know uh, uh, but then even in the older generation there is a lot of political maturity and wisdom uh, so so i would say it's a good balance uh, coming to economy uh, tenzing uh, tourism and hydropower are seen as two big, big economic earners for for bhutan its economy revenue mainly comes from there yeah. uh, so how are these two sectors currently doing and very broadly speaking how is the economy doing now in bhutan basically uh, in terms of uh, uh, tourism first uh, as i mentioned in your uh, in response to your first question we are going through a series of reforms so one of the major reform areas uh, is tourism and in tourism the aim of the government uh, is basically uh, to go for push shift bhutan from uh, let's say the rising <laughs> i wouldn't say we were there completely but we were heading towards mass tourism so prior to the pandemic bhutan was headed towards mass tourism uh, there were the increasing numbers and all of that you know uh, signs were there we were heading there uh, but i think after pandemic during the pandemic a lot of hard thinking went into what's uh, thing and i think to some extent just before the pandemic also so post pandemic we implementing um, a tourism kind of policy which will uh, basically look at uh, quality tourism you know we look at uh, we look at quality over numbers that is more sustainable uh, for a small country society like bhutan and it's as we speak is being implemented so tourism will open reopen from september 23rd and uh, i think we we will only know after that how the how this policy will be successful or not or what are the changes that are required to be made to tinker with this um, so that is tourism uh, and uh, i think the pandemic the last two years of the pandemic really affected tourism like elsewhere across the world um and it still hasn't picked up yet uh, i think in, everywhere in the world so so for bhutan to we are trying uh, something quite bold uh, at this moment uh, then in, in in terms of hydropower i think um, uh, basically you can look at the glass uh, half full or half empty if you look at it half empty uh, basically we were supposed to do uh, bhutan and india were supposed to do 10000 megawatts by 2020 uh, which was promised and signed on during the uh, uh tenure of uh, prime minister manmohan singh uh, around uh, 2008 he, uh, that pledge was made uh, so actually i mean just a quick background 2006 bhutan and india signed an agreement hydropower agreement to do, to do 5000 megawatts uh that was uh, then after elections we had elected government and, and, and as i said earlier elect, elect, elected governments are always ambitious they, so they kind of i think discussed with the government of india and prime minister manmohan singh announced 10000 megawatts by 2020 but the reality is right now we have finished only 720 megawatts one project mangdechu uh then puna sangchu 2 uh, may come online by 2024 uh, puna sangchu 1 is having some uh, uh i think geological issues which which we are trying to resolve uh so effectively uh, you know uh on the ground there's only one project which has been implemented and then there are the other mega reservoir projects like sunkosh which is around uh, 2560 i think megawatt uh, then we have uh, kuri gongri which is another 2600 uh, plus uh, megawatt so these have not been able to take off uh, and hydro in in bhutan is is essentially affected by the energy market which is india so i think in india a lot of things have happened on the renewable side the power rate has come down in terms of because you're doing a lot of solar you're doing a lot of wind uh, and then uh, i think in a sense thermal capacity is huge in india you have huge private sector players so power tariff rates have come down uh, and even your hydro projects uh, in india you have your own projects a lot of it is stuck have become unprofitable so for bhutan uh, i think the energy market in india energy india essentially has become energy self sufficient so that has changed the whole dynamics of this 10000 megawatt plus our delays financing issues this and that so i think going forward uh, bhutan uh, and india will have to uh, relook at this whole modality of uh, 10000 megawatt i think is not possible and uh, perhaps look at ways in where uh, because you solar can come in only when you have the wind and uh, no sorry when you have uh, the sun and uh, uh, wind is when you have the wind only so but uh when it's a downtime for this too uh you know storage reservoir projects uh takes uh value and uh, you know i think bhutan has 
there's two mega projects we, and, and of course other projects where you can do reservoir storage projects so these can kick in and supplement uh, you know with climate change and all i think that these are now the future of uh, of energy uh, so i think that is uh, happening on the hunt. and on the positive side also of course uh, the mangdechu project which was completed the 720 watt 720 megawatt project a couple of years ago was very useful during the pandemic because revenue from that project uh, bhutan and india could negotiate a pretty good tariff rate revenue from that project was very helpful when tourism was down and you know the other sectors were down so hydro is the biggest sector of our economy i think around close to 15% of gdp and uh, so uh, it has a future but the future has changed because of the energy market and how it and then one concern from uh, from bhutan uh, uh, is that uh, uh, you know uh, basically i think bhutan wants to change the modality of the project you know we would like to do uh, because of the the 10 projects in the 10000 the four were supposed to be joint ventures we were supposed to work with psu companies in india but unfortunately the first template project which was with uh, um, i think uh, sjv and uh, satlej jal vidyut nigam limited sjv uh, didn't work out because uh, uh, you know ironically it was thought that two psus from our side and the indian side would be much more efficient than the intergovernmental model but the the joint venture model has completely flopped in bhutan i mean uh, and the first venture was was cancelled which is kholongchu uh, around 600 megawatt project has been the joint venture model has been uh, cancelled and and i think a power secretary is supposed to come to bhutan uh, sometime soon either this month or next month to discuss the future of kholongchu and i think the bhutanese side will propose an intergovernmental model with change modalities wherever we hire the best people from the market instead of putting uh, bureaucrats from either side you know who are not as perhaps as efficient or are not as clued in and are not as uh, can, can you cannot hold a bureaucrat accountable and fire him so but if you hire a international management team you can give them targets and and, and fire them if they don't uh, do well so i mean uh, the, the modality is a major concern going forward and and that's one reason why sunkosh house also has been stuck apart from financing issues so i think hydro uh, basically has uh, a, a lot of future and uh, bhutan, between bhutan and india hydro is no, it's not just an economic project but it is now one of the foundation one of the cornerstones of uh, friendship between the two countries uh, and uh, the, like tala project when it happened uh, uh, when it was uh, launched back in 2006 uh, started it was commission at that time it was india's largest foreign investment i think india had invested close to 1 billion dollars uh, in in tala uh, uh, loan and grant combined and the benefit that india gets is uh, because a uh, lot of the financing is done from india you get uh, the rate of power is very cheap so very competitive uh, so yeah so i think uh, those uh, aspects so that's where hydro is at the moment and in, in the economy in general uh, last year we you know, not last year sorry in 2020 we had minus 10 growth rate gdp growth rate primarily because we implemented a very strict uh, policy of containment of zero covid uh, which helped save a lot of lives but it took a huge toll on the economy so we had shut down our international borders we shut down tourism everything was shut and whenever there was a case the whole uh, town or a whole nation used to be shut down quite frequently so that resulted in a growth rate of minus 10 gdp uh, in 2020 in 2021 the economy has recovered to around 4% growth of gdp and in 2022 we expect between uh, uh, 4.5 to 5.5% gdp growth this year so if things go well in 2022 now the downside is what's happening is uh, because we did not uh, our reserves have been have taken a hit because the last two years uh, tourism which is one of the main sources of foreign exchange for reserves um, so, so we're not as, uh, let's say, uh, in a situation like Nepal or Sri Lanka, but uh, there is a pressure on the reserves because now uh, the last two years you didn't have tourism dollars and other other avenues of foreign currency coming in uh, because of the pandemic. But now the pent up demand of the last two years for imports, like you know, construction and uh, equipment, and we are mostly import-driven economy, uh, not very really different from Nepal. So uh, that is is putting pressure on the reserve. So just uh, a couple of weeks ago, the government has uh, uh, put a moratorium on the import of uh, of uh, uh, you know our, what what you would call consumer vehicles. 
So you are still allowed to import trucks and excavators, and farmers can import the utility vehicles, whatever we like to call, which is essentially a bolero, you know, bolero thing. But like, if you want to have like a Creta or a, or whatever, uh, or, or an Alto or something, that will not be out for the next six months. So due to pressures on the reserves. So that's where the economy essentially is at, uh, and the unemployment rate. We jumped up in the last two years. It's it's still quite high. It's coming down, but it's still quite high. So I think that is where uh, the uh, economy is at here. Uh, you spoke about the pandemic, you know, but after a couple of years in the pandemic, through which through which Bhutan did reasonably well, as you as you brought out, how are these social indicators uh, holding up? You know, something like education, health. Were you able to manage uh, everything else during the pandemic? You know the theory going into the pandemic was that the richer countries would do better with uh, better better medical infrastructure, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I think uh, yeah, largely it was true to some extent uh, because they got the vaccines first and and and, and uh, all of that. But uh, I think what Bhutan showed is that uh, uh, two things. One is that uh, you don't necessarily have to be a rich country. to do well during a pandemic uh, uh so bhutan has invested in basic healthcare for a long time decades of investment and uh, if you look at the budget every year health and education they they suck up a chunk of the budget resources uh so it has always been a priority so we may not have uh, the best healthcare in the world in terms of quality and whatever different products and all but i think basic healthcare has penetrated well to the grassroots so that is one so that was very helpful uh, then the other thing is that in bhutan uh, the governance the style of governance in bhutan uh, uh, is very collaborative in nature so though we were uh, an absolute monarchy for a long time and and became a democracy only in 2008 but even prior to democracy there is this collaborative nature in bhutan where we come together and work in a united fashion so that took over uh, that kind of uh, mentality took over and then we had of course uh, good leadership uh, with the overall leadership being provided by his majesty uh, who took a very important uh, frontal role on this uh, and then we of course had a government which whose the prime minister was a is a is a medical doctor then the then we have a health minister who's a health policy expert and then we have of course uh, also one more minister and a foreign minister who's also a pediatric doctor so so i think uh, uh we couldn't have had this team at a at a better time uh so a combination of investment long term investment in 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 the health sector a combination of uh, uh good leadership a combination of the people coming together to cooperate because if the people didn't cooperate then i think things would also not have worked out so i think in that sense we could keep death rates incredibly low infection rates incredibly low and uh, bhutan could open up on its own terms so only when omicron came i think up to omicron bhutan was able to keep covid out essentially we had outbreaks but it was kept under control so uh, only when omicron came and then uh, the population had been vaccinated three times uh, some even four times you know uh, 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 and then we opened up gradually and and let let it spread in the community slowly you know and and at that time also deaths were very low incredibly low uh, you know so uh basically it's been a huge success story and 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 reported uh, globally as such by by the global media and the regional media of course uh so that is healthcare and uh now the downside of the pandemic is that so much resources went into covid like elsewhere because everything was pandemic focused so i think the other health programs couldn't get as much attention so now what's happened is post pandemic yes covid is still looked at carefully but the now there's a bigger push into other areas like cancer screening uh and 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 you know the other programs are are getting more and and people are encouraged to go to hospitals and 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 and, and all of that so that, so that is happening on the health sector and then uh, there's more infrastructure being put in place there's more budget being put in place on the education front also the pandemic took uh, a negative toll in terms of uh, the quality of teaching because uh, people stu- students couldn't attend classes and this and that but i think the neg- the positive was that uh, uh, that i think this online teaching really took off uh so now um, there is this uh, online teaching is being being part, made made part of the uh, academics uh, in, in in the tertiary education uh, and now also of course in the schools um and then 
I think now uh, we, the stu- we, we are back in the classrooms. Uh, the students and teachers are back in the classroom. So education also, like I mentioned uh, in your first question of the difference between post-pandemic Bhutan and pre-pandemic is that there is a series of reforms happening in the education sector as well. Uh, so we're looking at curriculum, re-looking at everything. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, so that's where these uh, two sectors are. So, so social indicators, yes, um, I think it's now, uh, uh, should go on the uptick now. Oh, that's that's nice to hear that the social indicators are looking upwards and going, going upwards. Uh, moving to a slightly uh, different area, but uh, very little is known about the popular culture of Bhutan outside. You know, Bhutan, because of its peculiar geography and the way it has kept itself, in a sense, uh, very secluded, very private from the rest of the world. For someone like me, who's an outsider completely, you know, what would you want to tell me about the popular con- popular culture that I should know about, about Bhutan? The popular image of Bhutan outside is like a kind of a Shangri-La kind of image. And, uh, you know, uh, a very mystic place of mystique and, and, and all of that. So I think, uh, yeah, I can understand that, uh, that that perspective also, you know, which we started uh, not, not only for Bhutan, but for this larger region with the book, I think, Shangri-La uh, by some British or American writer. And I, I forget, but this is, I mean, going way back. So that perception is there. Uh, uh, but I think, uh, and, and when you reach Bhutan, I think you, you will not be, uh, as a tourist, uh, you would not be disappointed. Why I say that is because when we uh, Bhutanese go out, let's say, uh, to any part of the world, uh, be it the West or East or whatever, um, or in the region, uh, when you always come back, you appreciate things more. Because when you're in Bhutan, you don't appreciate it as much, you know, it's a daily grind, whatever. But when you go out and come back, you appreciate uh, certain things. Like, for example, the environment. Mm, yeah still has, uh, I think, one of the highest, if not the highest uh, forest cover in the world uh, and, uh, you know, uh, pollution. And then we have a small population um, and then uh, a r- relatively clean environment. So so those things are there. Uh, and then I think natural beauty, you know, all of that. So I think uh, that is there. But again, uh, uh, the danger is you get stuck too much in that perception, you know. But Bhutan is definitely undergoing a lot of change. Uh, so you mentioned the culture. So in the popular culture, uh, basically you have, uh, again, I mentioned, we have a huge youth demographic. So there's a lot of rapid, uh, I would say, uh, uh, kind of uh, westernization, whatever, uh, taking place. The way our youth talk and think is quite different. Um, and uh, this is, I mean, feeding into everything. Again, with the reforms also, we would like to have the best practices in, in almost every field. So those are good things as well. You you learn the good things. So the Bhutan's effort has always been to imbibe the good things from out, outside and and try and avoid the negative effects. Uh, so I think uh, that is there. But I think one thing which is not known and which I think I I I, I kind of uh, goes back to your first question, pre and post pandemic Bhutan. One major difference is that. Uh, because people are exposed more to the outside world with the penetration, high penetration of the internet and all that, there is uh, something which is not very, uh, didn't happen in Bhutan as much before. There is a high degree of migration happening out. So a lot of the young people, early on, what is to do is after college, their main aspiration would be a government job or corporate job, you know, uh, or, uh, you know, in the private sector. When I say corporate, I'm talking of the government-owned uh, co- corporations. Uh, and then uh, with the private sector, oh, you start try and start something on your own. Uh, but now because of the exposure and uh, what's happening is a lot of Bhutanese are going out, especially young people. So they're going, they're finishing the college and they're going for masters abroad. And like I think the, the right now the most popular destination by far is Australia because uh, it allows you to study and to work. Uh, so you can and you can take. Uh, a dependent, which is like a wife uh, uh, or, or whatever, husband, whatever partner, you can take to Australia and they can also earn money and then, you know, a pretty good income. Uh, and then after you finish your master's, you can do three years, you get three years additional visa to use those skills. And then again, so I mean, a lot of Bhutanese are, I would say, migrating to Australia uh, and then some to Canada, some to the States. Uh, so I think that is one big change here. So I think Bhutan is very politically, very stable, very peaceful. So we are asking ourselves, why is this migration happening? 
So I think the answer coming back again and again is that uh, our economy is not able to deliver the quality jobs that uh, people need. So I think that is one major shift in the mindset uh, of the people. So I think uh, before it would be unheard of a Bhutanese not wanting to come back to Bhutan. But now because we have, uh, you know, this is partly due to the downside of the success of our education policy. We have edu education has really penetrated to the grassroots. So we give, a, I think the Bhutanese education system gives a, uh, I wouldn't say world class also, but I think a basic uh, decent education you get, you know, and then you have, and it's free, uh, up to college is free. Uh, so a lot of these youths are there and then, you know, uh, a small economy like Bhutan can manufacture only so many jobs. So a lot of the youths are heading out. Uh, and then, you know, uh, so that's a big thing uh, that's happening, which people <laughs> across the world don't know. Uh, so I think that is a major change, I would say. Uh, Tenzing, you are yourself a journalist, uh, have been in journalism for many years. Uh, media has seen a lot of changes in Bhutan, especially with the influx of social media. You know, how has the situation been in the in the journalism and media sector in Bhutan? So like everywhere else, because of the influx of uh, the, the, the social media and the digital uh, uh, kind of uh, transformation, uh, media, traditional media is now being forced to adapt. And now we'll increasingly throw the term digital media and then, you know, uh, online media and uh, 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 social media and all, all that in Bhutan. So um, the influx of social media has had both a negative and a positive. So I think the positive first, the positive is that uh, it's allowed, uh, I think, uh, the smaller players in the media to now have a platform to compete with the bigger established players who are essentially government owned, may not be government run, but government owned um, uh, players. So I think that is a good leveler, you know, so you have now you can reach a big audience using, uh, let's say, Facebook or, or Twitter. You know, uh, you can put your, you can put your, connect your website to these sites. So that is the positive. Uh, the other positive is that it has empowered a lot of Bhutanese because now they don't have to go to the media and kind of put forward the grievances. So they can go on social media and if things go viral, then you know it gets picked up and all that. You know, so I mean, so not very different from what happens around the world, including the region. Uh, now, the negative also is similar because what's happening is, uh, first of all, a lot of fake news uh, is, is coming up. And uh, the problem in countries like Bhutan, India, Sri Lanka, you name it, is that uh, Asia in general, is we may high, have improving or high literacy rates, you know, but the media and social media literacy rate is very low in all our countries. So as a result, people are educated enough to read the content online. But they're not educated. I mean, they're not, let's say, literate enough to uh, decipher what is fake, what is real, uh, you know, and uh, what they should stay away from, uh, what they should not share. So that literacy level is still still low. Uh, and then what I fear also for our region as a whole is our region is made up of different kinds of communities, ethnicities, all of that, right? Religions. And then social media studies after studies and also reporting after reporting, uh, be it New York Times or The Guardian or, or I mean, whatever, uh, have shown that in uh, countries which have uh, diverse sets of people, you know, are, are just coming out, developing, uh, social media can play a hugely negative role, uh, can, can seep into those uh, cracks, uh, as a Guardian piece put it in the case of Sri Lanka, and widen those cracks. So I fear that in addition to fake news, social media can create unnecessary hate online, uh, disunity online, and then, you know, hate language, defamation. So those things are also being faced in Bhutan. And then what makes it worse is that the social media companies, at least in the case of India, bigger markets like India or the US, the social media companies listen. They listen up when, when, they're, when they're hauled up, you know. But in the case of small countries like Bhutan, uh, you don't have that kind of leverage. So you might have a fake post running for, for a while. I mean, it has improved. Let's be fair to, to them also. It has improved. Uh, they have become more sensitive. So Facebook is, let's say, a little bit more prompt than before. Uh, but it's still an issue. There's, uh, you know, uh, defamation, online bullying, cyber bullying, and the youth also having a problem. A lot of the youths are now plugged in online with Insta and Facebook and God knows what else. But 
uh, uh, online video games also that's also become a form of interaction so you have cyber bullying you have internet addiction uh, so all of that so i mean um, and the media is now a part of this because we are we have to operate in that environment you know so the the media in bhutan is just uh, social media has become so big in bhutan that that to give you an example the largest media in bhutan is not the government owned bhutan broadcasting service or the government owned kunsal national paper it is facebook you know if you go by the numbers so i think a few years ago before the pandemic bhutan had around i think close to 400000 facebook accounts you know i mean a good portion would be of it at uh, would be perhaps fake or double accounts or whatever but but it it is a high number you know for a population of around 700000 um and then even for the uneducated in the rural areas you have like whatsapp where you can send the forwards through audio clips you don't necessarily have to type so the in, in the in the rural areas and then it leads to divorces it leads to issues in the rural areas also so this is something which is not really affecting the urban or the educated lot um so i think the media in bhutan like elsewhere has become a part of the social media environment now which has been created around us and how we nav- navigate it how we adapt to it uh i think uh, we will decide uh, our future and uh, i mean so so it has i think social media in bhutan has had some positives but there are negatives uh, as well uh, overall and for the media but right. considering you are yourself very active on social media and particularly in india where you have a lot of followers on twitter uh, how does today's india look to someone like you from bhutan okay um now uh, there is a definitely a a change you know uh, i think uh, this so called uh, in india if i if i comment as an outsider you had this nehruvian consensus post uh, 47 i think uh, that's over now you know effectively uh, in 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 so many ways and i think um, what's coming to the fore in india is basically i think um, uh, there is more i think stress on identity on 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 culture on 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 religion so that i think uh, is is coming more to the fore i think uh, whereas the india uh, of the past was i think uh, you would say uh, shift more more on the lines of a political science uh, textbook you know you have this parliament and political parties and mps and all but i think now uh, i would say that uh, of course in, in your politics you have different equations cast and all that but but now of course the identity in india seems to be quite central to your to your politics uh, and and that has negatives and positives i, I mean in 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 various ways uh, but um, i think uh, i think that is one major uh, change we can uh, see but i think on the that's your, your in in terms of your domestic uh, politics uh, but i think uh, an area where i would uh, also uh, i think i can comment on is in terms of foreign policy so i think india um, has uh, i think the previously again the nehruvian foreign policy has under, undergone change so i think now india is uh, more into real politic um, and uh, i think so so, so that is uh, that is there i think and also uh, india's relationship in the neighborhood i think giving prominence importance to the neighborhood that is a major shift in in, in foreign policy uh, and um, i think uh, that it's i would say that's a a good change also uh, quite a Uh, what is promised can be followed up and delivered um and then um, today's india is primarily a young india i think you know um uh, and then um uh, you know as an outsider i am always optimistic about the india story i'm always optimistic even now uh, you know with what's going happen- happening with your i mean the post pandemic or whatever unemployment or economy and other issues you know i'm always optimistic about the india story because i think uh, if you look at uh, uh, the diversity that you have uh, the size that you have uh, the the demographics that you have i think there's no way to go but only up you know and um, i think if uh, uh, and then uh, you have uh, a democratic structure a democratic system and i think uh, no matter which party comes to power or whatever i think people indian people at their heart essentially democratic in nature 
so you know i think uh, i think that will uh, in the long run so in maybe in the short race india may not uh, match up to certain competitors uh, uh, in terms of growth or whatever but i think in the long run your diversity your democracy your institutions like a, the like a free and strong media independent judiciary these and accountable political parties and leaders i think these will serve you all well in the in the long run and uh, and i think that uh, india will i've always believed will has always been and will always be a force of good in the region and in the world uh, what about the other big neighbor of yours china uh, uh, is there a sense of fear or a sense of opportunity about china and bhutan i think uh, frankly speaking both like among india's neighbors <laughs> bhutan is perhaps the last one left who is still not engaged uh with china in the full diplomatic sense um, we don't have diplomatic relations and that the official explanation is that we uh, china is one of the p5 countries and we have not established ties with any of the p5 countries yet you know so i think that's the uh, official line um but on the other hand i think uh, if you look at uh, uh i think opportunity um but i think before i get into those i think uh, it's important to clear up certain misconceptions uh what happens is like in a lot of the uh, writings in in india especially in the let's say media i mean media sphere uh, and i'm not saying everybody i mean there are good writers uh, who understand the situation and write very well but then uh, i would say there is there is a, a majority out there who are not well versed uh, who never been to bhutan that doesn't matter even if you're not here but even if you know people from me if you talk in the right people you understand the country also so those who don't talk to the right people uh, who speculate you know and uh, so uh, bhutan right now has i can say very confidently zero dollars chinese investment zero dollars you know so there is no chinese government projects or anything happening here and this is perhaps the only south asian countries you know ironically india would be having much more investment from china you know? so so i think uh, that is i think important to clear up so there's no like growing chinese investment or growing chinese tourists coming and all of that so our political economic engagement is very much south oriented with india you know so i think that is important to clear up uh, and also uh, uh, so at with china i think the relationship uh, is i would not say it's uh, 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 a very interactive one like like we have in india because our borders are closed in the north uh, we don't have even roads going into uh, into china uh, whatever you know um so there is a very limited engagement uh, economic or whatever uh, but at the same time i would say bhutan doesn't have a uh, let's say unfriendly relationship or unfriendly thing with uh, with china i mean so i mean uh, we are pretty uh, kind of uh, neutral that way uh, so uh, and uh, like <clears throat> so i think uh, with 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 china it's uh, it's 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 like that you know and um, so there's limited engagement uh, but then uh, the like for example uh, um in the future i think uh, as the relationship evolves uh, i think uh, uh, you could look you could look at uh, possibilities uh, here and there but uh, at the moment uh, the ground reality which is more important uh, than speculation is that there is no uh, there, there is an engagement in terms of the border talks process and that keeps going on sometimes it's uh, uh, you know basically uh, there's a gap little gap but it, it, it essentially the process goes on and i think uh, uh, things can move forward uh, i think once we can get things resolved uh, at the border you know you have to have a resolved border and before you can talk other things you know so i think uh, uh, that is a well known public putinist position uh, that you know you have to have a border a resolved border uh, so i think uh, other than that i think uh, no real uh, animosity towards china uh, and uh, i mean we live let live kind of policy i'm thinking my final question how often do you travel to india now and when is your next visit to india so my most frequent destination is uh, india because i keep coming there for either seminars or 
or some invitation to take part in the conference or or, or some think tank thing. So, so um, because of the pandemic, I think most Bhutanese we have restricted our travel, uh, and we're still yet to get out of the pandemic mentality when it comes to travel. I was invited to a conference in Nepal uh, in the first week of uh, September, but um, I've declined, you know, because we. <laughs> <laughs> still not very sure about the how the pandemic is evolving and you know uh, we do want to uh, kind of bring back the virus home so still i think that uh, though we, most of us have been vaccinated three times and even four times you know, so there is a bit of that i think uh, time for the creaky joints to uh, kind of uh, would need to start traveling freely but i'm sure it will come maybe with time uh, once we open up uh, on september 23rd and once um, uh, the pandemic kind of dies down and perhaps hopefully becomes an uh, uh, becomes a endemic so i think that uh, otherwise um, I'm, I'm i hope to travel to india soon uh, for for any number of uh, engagements yeah tenjing look forward to seeing you in india and as always it was a pleasure talking to you thank you so much for being on spotlight south asia yeah, thank you for having me Thank you for listening. For more information on our work, follow us on Twitter at CPR underscore India and log on to our website at www.cprindia.org.